The learning objectives of this chapter are that you will recognize the need for a fuel standard. Know that the current standard for marine fuels is ISO 8217, 3rd edition, 2005. Know that the standard covers two groups of fuels, marine distillate fuels and marine residual fuels. Be familiar with the content of the standard and be able to relate the parameters contained within the standard to shipboard operations and possible problems. It is almost certain that at some time or other you or a colleague will have made a statement about the quality of the fuel that has been supplied to your vessel. This may have arisen due to some handling or operational problem that has been experienced. What do we actually mean by quality of a fuel? Do we consider the stability of the fuel when we store it, or do we mean how it performs from an ignition or combustion perspective? Is it clean? There are so many different aspects that we can consider when discussing quality of a fuel that it is difficult to give a meaning to the term fuel quality without identifying a specific aspect. Some fuels which store well may not perform well or may have a low energy potential. The increased use of marine residual fuels produced from more complex refining methods has made some of these issues more significant to the ship's engineer. In order to make sense of the term fuel quality in a way that helps us to understand and deal with poor quality fuel, then we should determine exactly which aspect of quality we are considering. Some of the main aspects that affect you as a marine engineer on board ship are listed below. Degree and type of contamination, stability during storage, compatibility with other fuels, ease of handling, transfer and treatment, energy equivalence, physical properties, Chemical makeup, ignition performance, combustion performance, damage to and wear of engine components, fouling potential, turbocharger and exhaust system, pollution potential. How do we deal with questionable fuel quality? If we have some reliable indicator to quality when the fuel is supplied to the ship, then we can plan how we will store and use the fuel. To achieve this, we obviously must be able to measure the fuel that we receive against some standard. In fact, we can go further back than this and actually order the fuel according to a standard. The international standard in current use is the ISO 8217 fuel standard, 3rd edition, 2005. In the rest of this chapter, we will be looking at the standard in some detail, so that you are familiar with the content and scope. This should help you deal with fuel quality issues more effectively. The need for an international standard was recognized due to the wide variation in the specifications of marine fuel. A working party was set up in 1982 to look at the problem. The draft proposal produced by this working party became the original ISO 8217 Petroleum Products Class F specification of marine fuels, which was published in 1987. This contained limits for a number of physical, chemical and contaminant parameters which were considered important in establishing a consistent quality supply of marine fuels internationally. The old British standard for marine fuels, BSMA 100, was reissued in 1989 as an exact copy of ISO 8217. In 1996, the second edition of ISO 8217 was issued with additional information relating to contaminants such as aluminium and silicon and sediment potential included. The third and current edition was issued in 2005 and includes indicators for used lubricating oil content and also reflects the new sulfur content limits from air pollution regulations arising from Annex 6 of MARPOL. It also includes a reduced maximum limit for ash content and changes to some of the viscosity reference temperatures. The current ISO 8217 contains two tables, one of which covers four marine distillate fuel grades and the other covers ten marine residual fuel grades. The parameters covered by each of the tables are similar, with some minor differences in the layouts, mainly due to the distillate table having some additional parameters. 
the number of grades for residual fuel has been reduced from the previous 15 grades down to 10. This is due to the fact that some of the previous grades were never actually supplied commercially, or the difference between some grades was so minor that it was felt that it was unnecessary to differentiate between them. We will look at the two tables and the parameters covered over the next few pages of this chapter. The table shows the four distillate fuel grades covered by ISO 8217. A scroll facility is provided so that you can view the table contents. Across the top of the table, you will see the code designation for each of the four grades of distillate fuel. They are DMX, DMA, DMB, and DMC. The first two letters of each grade, D and M, denote distillate marine. The third letter identifies each of the four grades. The left-hand column shows the parameter that is being considered and we will be looking at these in detail over the next few pages to see how they affect operations on board your ship. The right-hand column shows the standard test method to be used when establishing the parameter values. There is no need for you to know these test methods for this module, but the references are included in case you wish to learn about them anyway. You can, if you wish to in the future, obtain further information directly from the International Organization for Standardization's website regarding any ISO standards. This table shows the 10 residual fuel grades covered by ISO 8217. Again, a scroll facility is provided so that you can view the table contents. Across the top of the table, you will see the code designation for each of the 10 grades of residual fuel. The first two letters of each grade, R and M, denote residual marine. The third letter and the number identify each of the ten grades. The number is derived from the viscosity measured at a temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. We will look at viscosity more closely later in this chapter. As with the distillate fuel table, the left-hand column shows the parameter that is being considered. We will look at these in detail over the next few pages to see how they affect operations on board your ship. As with the distillate fuel table, the test methods are shown for information only. Again, further detail is available from the International Organization for Standardization. Now let us consider the parameters contained in the two tables we have just looked at. Over the next few pages of the module, we will be looking in detail at the various parameters and properties included in the ISO 8217 tables. Just as important, we will also look at some that are not included in the tables and be asking why. Remember, if you are not familiar with some of the parameters or the units of measurement, the definitions for them can be accessed by pressing the buttons for that particular item. So let's get started. A very high value of density can indicate that a residual fuel has been produced from an intense refining process. The fuel may also have been blended with lighter components to bring it within the specification of the fuel standard. You will need to have information about the fuel density for a number of operational reasons. It is an important physical property for calculating the quantity of fuel for storage purposes, for vessel stability purposes, and for fuel treatment requirements, and in particular when setting up centrifuges as purifiers for separating out any water from the fuel. Click on the buttons for more information on this parameter and to see the values in the standards table. Density is the term used to relate the mass of a substance to its volume. Both density and volume vary with temperature and therefore density is usually stated with the temperature at which it is measured. We can either give the density as an actual quantitative value or we can use a relative value. The SI units used for the density are normally kilograms per meter cubed, although we sometimes use grams per cubic centimeter. Relative density has no units. It is the density of a substance relative to the density of fresh water at 4 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, one cubic meter of fresh water has a mass of one ton, or a thousand kilograms, and the density is denoted as a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. The relative density of water under the above conditions is given a value of 1. Here's an example. A cubic meter of fuel oil at 15 degrees Celsius with a mass of 985 kilograms would be said to have a density of 985 kilograms per meter cubed at 15 degrees Celsius and a relative density of 0.985.
High density fuels are also often associated with operational problems, such as poor ignition performance, poor combustion performance, and high potential for fouling. In the ISO 8217 tables, the density of fuel is stated in kilogram per meter cubed at 15 degrees Celsius. When fuel is delivered and stored on board, the temperature will usually be different to the standard temperature. The density can be calculated at 15 degrees Celsius using correction tables to check the value against the standard given in ISO 8217. Density of liquids, including fuels, can be measured simply using a hydrometer. Viscosity is an important property when discussing marine fuel oils. It dictates the ease at which the fuel can be transferred from one tank to another, and also how effectively it can be pre-treated before final use. Since viscosity varies inversely with temperature, then we can control it by heating the fuel in storage and in use. Click on the buttons for more information on this parameter and to see. A strict definition of viscosity can be stated as the resistance of a fluid to deformation due to applied shear stress. In a simpler, more practical expression, we can say that viscosity is the resistance of a fluid to flow. Viscosity varies with temperature and should always be stated at a reference temperature. When discussing marine fuel oil, we talk in terms of kinematic viscosity. This is the dynamic viscosity, which is a measure of the fuel's molecular frictional resistance divided by the density. The units for kinematic viscosity are centistokes, where one centistoke is equal to one millimeter squared per second. If the viscosity of the fuel is too high, then it may overload transfer pumps, or in extreme cases and particularly at low temperatures, it may not be possible to pump the fuel. Diesel engines operating on residual fuel oil require the viscosity at the injectors to be in the range of approximately 10 to 27 centistokes to ensure correct atomization of the fuel. It is therefore essential that the heating capacity for storage, pretreatment, and service systems is sufficient. Otherwise, fuel which is within specification may become unusable. Residual fuels require heating in storage to allow transfer at reasonable viscosities, and also they must be heated during pretreatment processes to allow proper cleaning and viscosity control before use. Microcarbon residue is considered as a measure of the potential fouling effect of a fuel when used in a diesel engine, and also as a possible indication of the combustion performance. It is measured as a percentage by mass of residue per mass of fuel. And the value is obtained by heating the fuel in an inert atmosphere. Microcarbon residue has replaced Conradson carbon residue, which was used as the indicator in the original version of the standard and is considered equivalent to it. Click on the button to see the values for this parameter in the standards table. If combustion conditions are not ideal, and in particular we have an insufficient supply of combustion air or poor atomization of the fuel. Then the potential fouling may be realized, and excessive carbon deposits will occur. This will have an adverse effect on the engine operation due to deposits in the combustion chamber and exhaust gas system. High indicated values of microcarbon residue can also mean that the ignition and combustion quality of the fuel is poor, resulting in high mechanical and thermal stresses within the cylinder during the combustion process. The quantity of water in the fuel is important for both commercial and operational reasons. In the ISO 8217 standard, the water content is measured as a percentage by volume. From a commercial point of view, the ship owner does not want to pay fuel prices for water. Any water present also reduces the actual quantity of fuel being delivered and may affect the operating range of the vessel, and also lead to problems with the engine and associated equipment. Click on the button to see the values for this parameter in the standards table. Water should be removed from the fuel prior to use in the engine in order to avoid operational problems. The removal methods employed on board ship are usually a combination of settling tanks, centrifuges, and/or coalescer filters. Excessive water content may overload these removal facilities, allowing water to be carried through to the engine's fuel injection system. The operational problems that you could experience may include corrosion of injection system components, interruption to fuel supply, breakdown of cylinder lubrication resulting in high wear rates of cylinder liners and piston rings, 
blocking of filters due to emulsions and sludges, and overloading of water removal facilities such as coalescers and purifiers. The above will result in an increase in downtime for the vessel, maintenance for the crew, and running cost for the ship owner. The sulfur content of the fuel has taken on even greater significance with the implementation of Marpol Annex 6. The latest regulations have introduced new limits on the sulfur content of fuels for marine diesel engine use. The new regulations will affect the day-to-day -day operating procedures on board, and you should ensure that you are familiar with them. These new limits are intended to reduce the atmospheric pollution from ships, which can cause health and environmental problems. In particular, SOX, which is an abbreviation for the oxides of sulfur produced during combustion of fuel containing sulfur, may lead to the formation of so-called acid rain. The permitted sulfur content varies depending on the actual grade of the fuel, with an absolute maximum of 4.5% for general use and a 1.5% limit within SOX emission control areas, or SECRs for short. Some flag states have even more stringent limits. Apart from the air pollution risk of operating with fuel containing sulfur, there are also operational problems of which you should be aware. During combustion of fuel oil, the sulfur which is present burns to form different oxides of sulfur. These oxides will combine with any water vapor produced by combustion to produce acidic vapors. If the surface temperatures in the combustion chamber or exhaust system fall below the condensing temperature, the dew point of these vapors, then liquid acid will form on the surfaces. This can lead to so-called cold corrosion of the surfaces. To reduce the risk of cold corrosion, it is necessary to use cylinder oils with a suitable alkalinity or base number and to maintain surface temperatures above the dew point whenever possible. Click on the buttons for more information on this parameter and to see the values in the standards table. When the sulfur contained in fuel oil burns in the combustion process, sulfur dioxide will form through the combination of sulfur and oxygen, as can be seen here in the equation. Due to the excess oxygen present in the diesel engine cylinder, the sulfur dioxide combines with more oxygen to produce sulfur trioxide, as seen in the next equation. Hydrogen in the fuel burns to form water vapor, which combines with the sulfur trioxide to form sulfuric acid vapor, as seen in the final equation. If the surface temperatures of the engine components are too low, this vapor can condense to form liquid sulfuric acid, which can result in cold corrosion damage to the components. Sediment can be defined as the solid dirt, both organic and inorganic, in a liquid which would normally settle out when the liquid is left to stand. The total sediment existent, TSE, is a parameter which is only measured for distillate fuels. TSE is measured by passing a sample of fuel through a filter paper and weighing the amount of dirt collected. There is no pretreatment of the sample prior to filtration. You will see later that this is not the case for measuring sediment for residual fuels. You know from earlier study in this module how distillate fuels are produced. They should contain little or no dirt from the production process. From the standards table, you can see that the DMX and DMA grades have a zero limit for total sediment existent. Any sediment found will normally come from storage, transport, or handling after production. Click on the button to see the values for this parameter in the standards table. As stated earlier, the amount of sediment as TSE in a distillate fuel should be very small if the fuel meets the limits of the standard. It should therefore not present any real problems during operation. If, however, the fuel is off-spec, as you would probably refer to a fuel not meeting the standard, then there is a risk of problems. With very high levels of TSE, there is a risk of sediment in storage tanks, overloading of purifiers and fuel filter blockage. You can prevent operational problems by cleaning these three items more frequently. If the sediment contains hard particles and is not removed, then high wear rates may be experienced with components of the fuel system. This will mean that you have to carry out maintenance more often than normal. You will probably associate ash as the debris left after burning coal or wood on an open fire. When we refer to the ash content of a liquid fuel, we are really looking at all of the content of the fuel which will not burn. This is normally inorganic material, including metallic elements, sand and dirt. 
Some of these are soluble in the fuel, and some are present as solids. The origin of the ash elements may be the crude source, the refining process, or handling processes. As you would expect, the ash levels permitted in distillate fuels are minimal. A number of the ash elements are given special treatment within the standard because they can lead to severe operating problems. These include vanadium, aluminium, and silicon, and we will look at these in detail over the next few pages. Click on the button to see the values for this parameter in the standards table. During combustion, much of the ash content is oxidized and exists as extremely hard particles. These particles can result in high rates of wear within the engine cylinder and turbocharger. They may also form deposits in the engine cylinder, on exhaust valves, and throughout the exhaust system. As you can imagine, high wear rates and heavy deposits are not likely to give good operating performance. And every effort should be made to remove as much of the ash as possible prior to using the fuel. It should be possible to remove most of the solid ash in a separator, but this will not help with those elements which are soluble in the fuel. The most common of these soluble elements is vanadium, and we will see how to deal with this later in this section. The limit on flash point given in the ISO 8217 standard has always been a legal requirement rather than a guide or recommendation. This is recognized in the various classification society rules as a necessary limit from a point of safety. You should be aware that the flash point is the temperature at which flammable vapors will be given off by the fuel. These vapors can be ignited by an external ignition source. This should not be confused with the auto ignition or self ignition temperature, where ignition will occur without an external ignition source. To minimize the risk of flammable vapors being produced. Fuel should not normally be stored within 10 degrees Celsius of the flash point. The flash point should be determined by an approved closed cup method, such as the Penske-Martin test equipment or similar, as required by Solas. Fuel with a flash point below 60 degrees Celsius cannot normally be stored in a machinery space. Fuels with a flash point not less than 43 degrees Celsius may be used for emergency generators, but must be stored separately. Click on the button to see the values for this parameter in the standards table. As has already been stated, vanadium is soluble in the fuel, which means it cannot be removed through centrifuging. In fact, there is very little that can be done to remove the vanadium from the fuel. If you have high levels of vanadium in the fuel and certain other conditions exist, then it is likely that you will experience engine damage. The mechanism responsible for this is a chemical reaction referred to as high temperature corrosion. Click on the buttons for more information on this parameter and to see the values in the standards table. When the vanadium contained in fuel oil is exposed to the combustion process in the presence of sodium, various compounds may form. Many of these compounds contain vanadium pentoxide. These compounds take the form of semi-liquid salts, which have relatively low melting points. These salts will deposit onto metal surfaces, and with the right temperature conditions, fuse with the parent metal. The fused deposit can break away from the parent metal if the temperature falls due to differential expansion. This will remove some of the parent metal and expose more of it to new deposits, and so the process is repeated. This process is referred to as high temperature corrosion. The rate of corrosion is dictated by the component material. And also the ratio of sodium to vanadium. With some typical engineering materials, a ratio of one to three results in the highest corrosion rates and should be avoided. The engine designer will consider this when selecting component materials. As you will appreciate, as more of the parent metal is removed from a component, the weaker the component will become. At some stage, total failure will occur. High temperature corrosion can damage any of the components in the diesel engine combustion chamber or exhaust system. This will occur whenever the surface temperature is above the melting point of the vanadium-based salts formed during the combustion process. Piston crowns, exhaust valves, and turbochargers are the components most at risk from high temperature corrosion. If we consider an exhaust valve which is subject to hot corrosion, then the symmetry will be lost due to the removal of some metal. This can lead to distortion of the valve. This will cause leakage at the valve seat, further raising the temperature, resulting in early failure of the valve. 
Deposits on turbocharger blades can cause imbalance, leading to bearing and rotor damage. Even though sodium can be removed from the fuel during centrifuging, it can still be present in the combustion air. When vanadium is present in the fuel, you should ensure that the engine is operated with exhaust temperatures less than 450 degrees Celsius to minimize the risk of hot corrosion. The aluminium and silicon content of the fuel comes from the refining process, where it is used as a catalyst. The majority of the catalyst is reclaimed, and the very small particles present in the fuel are difficult to remove. These very small particles are referred to as catalytic fines. These two elements were included in the overall ash content in the first edition of ISO 8217. They were shown as a separate parameter in the second and third edition as a result of increased concern over the effect on engine operation. Aluminium and silicon oxide are extremely hard particles. You may be familiar with aluminium and silicon oxides as the basis of some grinding pastes and grinding wheels. Click on the button to see the values for this parameter in the standards table. The catalytic fines are difficult to remove in a centrifuge because they are so small. Similarly, they are difficult to remove by conventional filters as they tend to pass through the mesh. The use of fine filters and low separator throughput rates may remove some of the particles, but this is not always possible. The particles can result in rapid wear of the engine components, especially in the fuel injection system and the engine cylinder. The particles can get into the fine clearances between components and penetrate oil films, resulting in abrasive wear. As fuel oil is cooled, some of the liquid components change to semi-solid waxes. When sufficient wax is formed, then the fuel stops flowing. This will also be the point at which filters will become blocked. This is obviously unacceptable from an operational point of view. The temperature at which this occurs is referred to as the pour point. It is necessary to know what the pour point of a fuel is for storage and transfer. As a general rule, fuel should be stored at a temperature of no less than 10 degrees Celsius above the pour point. The pour point is included for storage and handling reasons. It is defined as the temperature at which fluid flow ceases and is usually given as a temperature which is 3 degrees Celsius above the point when flow appears to stop. Click on the button to see the values for this parameter in the standards table. Under normal circumstances, problems with fuels due to poor point are unlikely, unless you are operating in extreme cold conditions. Distillate fuels are often treated with additives to lower the poor point when they are to be used in cold or arctic conditions. In the event that the storage temperature falls below the pore point, then the wax crystals that form may coat the heating coils. The wax is a natural insulator, and it may be impossible to heat the fuel sufficiently through the wax to bring it back to a pumpable condition. In such circumstances, the only way to resolve the problem may be to manually clean the fuel tanks to remove the wax from the heating coils. The other problem associated with pour point is the blockage of cold filters due to the same wax forming process. You may have heard of this referred to as cold filter plugging. The cloud point is only included in the distillate fuel table and then only for the DMX grade fuel. It is often confused with the pour point but does have a separate definition. As has been stated already, waxes form when fuel oils cool down. When this happens with a high-grade distillate, such as DMX grade, then the wax crystals turn the otherwise bright and clear liquid hazy, as if a cloud has appeared in it, hence the term cloud point. Obviously, this hazy appearance can only be detected if the fuel is clear and bright, and would be impossible to measure if we tried it with residual fuel. Like pour point, cloud point is included as an indication of storage and transfer problems which may occur at low temperatures. Click on the button to see the values for this parameter in the standards table. A key performance feature of a fuel oil is how easily it can be ignited. There are a number of indicators used, depending on the actual fuel type. All of the indicators, either by measurement or calculation, give information regarding the ignition delay or the ignition quality measured as a delay. The cetane index is one of the indicators of ignition performance for distillate fuels, and you will see that a value is given in the table for three of the distillate grades.
The value is obtained by calculation, taking into account the fuel density and the distillation range of the fuel, with higher values indicating better quality. Another common indicator for distillate fuels is the cetane number. This has approximately the same numeric value as the cetane index, but is obtained by ignition of a test fuel containing cetane in a special test engine. The number represents the percentage of cetane used to get the same delay as the fuel in question. Neither of these indicators is used for residual fuels, as we will discuss later. Click on the button to see the values for this parameter in the standards table. If the cetane index of the fuel is low, then it is likely that you will experience problems of increased ignition delay. Potentially, this could result in an increase in fouling of the combustion chamber and exhaust system due to poorer combustion performance and reduced time for combustion to be completed. As the name suggests, appearance is a visual indicator as to the quality of a fuel and is only applied to the better quality distillate fuels. As can be seen from the standard, the DMX and DMA grades both need to be clear and bright to be within specification. Any cloudiness or discoloration would indicate contamination or an off-spec fuel. Click on the button to see the values for this parameter in the standards table. One of the main changes to the tables contained in the third edition of the ISO 8217 standard is the inclusion of limits for these three chemical elements. When all three elements are found to be present at levels above the maximum limits given in the standards, then this could be taken as evidence that the fuel is contaminated with used lubricating oil. This can only occur when the used lubricating oil has been intentionally introduced into the fuel as a means of disposal. Click on the buttons for more information on this parameter and to see the values in the standards table. in the oil plus the contamination and oxidation that occur during use make the risk to the environment and health very real. It is not possible to dispose of it easily and it is expensive to reprocess. Large amounts of used lubricating oil result from the automotive industry. A solution to the problem was seen to be to dump the used lubricating oil into heavy fuel stocks, in particular marine residual fuel. This has now been recognized as bad practice hence the inclusion of limits within the fuel standard. Used lubricating oil in fuel is undesirable for many reasons. Probably the most important reason, as far as you are concerned, is that it is likely to contain a high level of abrasive and corrosive elements, which will cause damage to the engine. In addition to this, combustion of the additives may produce ash and combustion gases, which can be highly toxic. We have already discussed the total sediment existent which is measured for a distillate fuel. When considering residual fuels, we need to know not only if it contains sediment in the natural state, but if there will be any further sedimentation at higher temperatures. This will give some indication of the problems that might occur during storage and treatment. Total sediment potential is measured by filtering a sample of fuel which has been heated to a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. This is meant to simulate the effect of aging of the heated fuel in storage and should indicate any sediment that would be produced. This high temperature, which you will realize is well above normal storage temperatures, should give a good indication over the relatively short test time. If the fuel has a tendency to produce large amounts of sediment after being stored for a period of time, then it should be obvious that this will increase the load on filters and treatment equipment. In extreme cases, this can lead to problems in maintaining a fuel supply to the engine and may prevent you from keeping the engine running.